Hi, and uh, welcome to this talk. I'm going to talk for the next hour or so. I'm going to talk to you about using Spring and Scala. My name is Arjen Poutsma. I'm a staff engineer for working for Spring Source by VMware. Here's my Twitter handle as well if you want to follow me on Twitter. Before we start, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been doing enterprise development for about 18 years now. Um, joined Spring Source, or Interface 21, as it was called back then. In 2005, I did the uh, still doing the web service project. It's part of the Spring Portfolio project. And um, did the Spring 3 REST support that you might have heard of. And recently, I've dabbled into Scala. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the next hour. So before we start, I want to see some hands. Who here is using Spring? I think probably most of you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, who here is using Scala? It's about half, I'd say. Well, don't worry. It's not going to be tough. I'm not going to do anything advanced in Scala. Uh, just pretty simple stuff. <clears throat> but I'm going to show you how you can combine these two things, right? So using Spring in the Scala language. So the first question you might want to ask yourselves is why, why would I use Scala, especially the people who are not using it, right? So why would we do this? Well, there's a lot of advantages here. So the first thing is it runs on the JVM, right? So you have <coughs> probably some kind of production environment already which handles JVM. You might be running Tomcat, you might be running TC server, any kind of, so that's already done, right? You, you're running on the JVM. It's type safe, that uh, appeals to some people, it appeals to me, for instance. I like my languages type safe. Um, and there's all these other kind of features. I'm not gonna go over all of them because it's, it will take too much time, but it's, <clears throat> there's type inference, there's a lot of functions are really first class citizens of the language as opposed to Java where you just have maybe callback interfaces and stuff. I'll talk more about it later. You have things like traits, you have pattern matching, very powerful. I'm going to show you some examples of that as well. XML literals, actors, case classes. All these features are really a compelling reason to use Scala, right? Um, if you compare it to Java, <clears throat> specifically for the purpose of this talk, right? Because we're talking about using a Java framework, as it were, Spring in Scala. There's a couple of things I want to focus on. Um, in Java, we use anonymous inner functions for things like templates and callbacks, etc., uh, or anonymous inner classes, of course. In Scala, we have functions for that. So I'm gonna, we're probably going to use functions somewhere along this talk, right? In Java, you typically return null if you have no return value. But in Scala, you have the, the option of returning an option, right? So it could be either something or Nothing. More about that later as well. It's, Scala is quite concise. You can write a class in as little as one line. That's hard, <clears throat> very hard to do in Java. You could do it, but it's pretty hard to do. Um, you have getter and setter generation, or access for generation. You have good capabilities of DSLs, creating DSLs, because the language is so flexible, right? So I'm going to show that as well. Um, the downside, however, is the last one. It's a bit slow. So I'm going to do some demos later, and it might need some time to compile the whole thing. It's compiled right now, so maybe I won't need to run it again, but we'll see. So the second question is why Spring, right? So why would you want to use Spring in Scala? Well, the counter question is really why not, right? It's, it's a proven technology. I just said, told, saw that most of you are already using Spring, so maybe this slide is completely unnecessary because you're probably already convinced of the advantages that Spring bring you, but at least we have been working on Spring in some form for about 10 years now. It's really a mature framework. It's solid. It's, it's very uh, uh, proven in the field. And there's a lot of people out there who know uh, Spring. There's about 5 million of them, according to Gartner. Now, I'll be the last to say that you have to trust Gartner, so <laughs> don't take with others. But there's a lot of people out there who know Spring. It's easy to find new people who can help you in your project. It's a consistent approach that you have in Spring, right? If you know how to use, for instance, a JDBC template, it's pretty easy to pick up something like the JMS template or the REST template. There's a similar consistent approach across all the framework parts. Um, and it's not st stopping, right? We are continually improving. We are focusing on things like NoSQL right now. We have Neo4j in Spring Data Project, Gemfire, Hadoop, Redis. All these kinds of NoSQL approaches are in Spring Data right now. Also, social integration with Twitter, with Facebook, with LinkedIn. All these kinds of features are still being worked on. And that's something that really gives you an advantage, I think. So now we get to the meat and potatoes of this talk, right? Spring Scala. What is Spring Scala? Well, it's a very, uh, it's a project, it's a new project. I announced it last week at our own conference in, uh, in Washington, D.C. this year, called Spring One. 
And the basic the goal of this, this project is very simple, just to make it easier to use Spring in Scala. Right, that's it. Nothing very simple to explain. And how do we do that? Well, basically, because Scala runs on the JVM, and Spring also runs on the JVM, it's written in Java, we just provide some layers on top of the Java framework. We're just saying, okay, well, how can we make it easier to use this stuff from Java? And that's what I'm going to show you in the rest of the presentation, uh, how we did that. <clears throat> so these are basically the features I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Five of them, or four of them, I can't count. We're going to start off with wiring up Spring or Scala beans, right? Classes, Scala classes, and wiring up in XML. There's some issues there that you might want to think about, and there's also some support that we offer in the Spring Scala project. Then we're going to show you. I'm going to show you how to wire them up in Scala, right? It's a very compelling uh, option. Be one of the things I always hear about Spring is that uh, it's only XML programming and it's not type safe and all that kinds of. Um, I call them BS, <laughs> probably. It's not true, right? You can, XML is just one of the options to configure your Spring container, and you, as you probably know, because you're all Spring developers. Just one of the ways to do it. You can use Java config annotations, you can use anything you want, XML just one being one of them. And now we have a new one, it's in Scala. I'm gonna show you how to, we have support for Scala collections in the project, and I'm also gonna show you some Scala-friendly versions of the Spring templates. So let's get started. Um, when you're thinking about wiring up a, a Scala bean in Spring XML, once again, that's just one of the options. You don't have to use XML, but it's one of the options. Um, there are basically three options, right? So if you're wiring up a Spring bean or a Scala bean in a Spring XML, three options there. First of all, constructor injection. Right? It's very simple approach saying all the required properties that this bean has, this class has, I'm going to express them through constructor values or in Scala, just part of the, the class constructor basically. <coughs> And it will work, right? There's no issues there, because a constructor in Scala is the same as a constructor in Java. So there's no magic that you have to do. The added advantage that you get from that is that you get immutability, right? Scala being also, it's part of OO language, it's also a very functional language, and functional programming is all about being immutable. If you have your data structures are immutable, then you'll end up with a lot of interesting problems later. So constructor injection really fits well in the whole Scala world, if you know what I mean, right? You have required things, you put them in a constructor, once constructed, the class is type safe, or, or thread safe. If you do want to use getters and setters, or specifically setters for, this, for injecting stuff, then you always have the possibility of using a Scala annotation called bean property. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Basically what that annotation does, it's a Scala annotation once again, and it will just generate the Java getters and setters for you. Why is that necessary? I'll show you on the next slide. Finally, we get to the last option. Maybe it should be the first option, but I wanted to give them in some order. Um, we actually have support, native support for Scala setters. Right? So what, is a, what does that mean, native support for Scala setters? Well, if you have the class on the left, right? Very, like I said, very simple class. Scala is really uh, condensed in, its, in that sense. Very simple class, just one variable. And on the right-hand side, I have basically the Java version of that, right? It's not completely correct, probably, but it's, it's clear, getting close. So by saying this is a, we have a class with a var, var means it's mutable, it's a mutable property. What you end up is not just a constructor, as you can see uh, right there, right? The constructor is not just there, which assigns the, the string, but you also get a getter and setter. However, those getters and setters are different than the Spring ones. They don't follow, Java does not, or Scala does not follow the Java bean contract. You see that the getter, if you can call it that, is actually just a field name in a way, right? Just B in this case. And the setter is the field name uh, appended with some strange suffix, like underscore, dollar sign, equals, or something. That's the Java, the, the bytecode that gets generated as a consequence of this left-hand uh, class. Now, because these properties are not conformed to the uh, Java bean contract, as I said before, right, these are not getters and setters in the Java bean sense, we need to do something. And I'm going to show you what options you have right now. And I'm going to show you what options you have right now. So I'm going to switch to my first demo. And I'm going to just show you some simple stuff. I hope this is readable in the back as well. Is it? Yeah? If not, you have to move forward. forward. <laughs> So once again, very simple class, <clears throat> just a constructor value right there. And I can wire it up quite easily, right? This is just a Spring XML. 
Uh, let's get rid of this because we don't need that for now. I'm just wiring out that class and I'm just going to use a constructor arc, basically. This is the C namespace. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but you might be aware of the P namespace where you can just assign properties as part of the uh, as attributes, basically, as we do here. You can also do it with constructor. So basically what this does is pretty much the same as uh, there we go, and then value is bar, right? That's it's the same as this, basically. So I'm going to go back to what I had. So I'm going to inject the value bar into this constructor class. Very simple. That should work. I have a very simple project for that, very simple startup application. Just opening that application context right there in Scala, right? just using some Java classes, then getting it being and printing the value. Well, that won't surprise you that this will actually work. And you'll see bar right there. Gets a bit more interesting with setter injection, as I said, because constructors are pretty much the same in Scala and Java. Uh, setters are a bit different, as I said before. So what do we do here? Well, I wired it up quite easily here. So let's say setter bean. Let's show you what the setter bean does. Right? For now, it's just a var. Means a var means mutable, so we at least get a setter. Right? If it was been a, would have been a val, that would have been, wouldn't have been a getter or a setter. Sorry. So because of the var, we actually do get a setter. It's mutable. And I annotate it with this Scala annotation bean property. What that does, it triggers the Scala compiler to create these getters and setters. I can show you if I just compile this. And I can show you the output of Java P. Let me see, put it here. So what I'm doing here, Java P, basically a basic disassembler, just showing you the class as it would look like from a, 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 a Java perspective. So it's just a public class, blah, blah, blah. It's a specific implement of a specific interface. And then you see this, right? The, the Scala getter, <coughs> the Scala setter. But you also see get and set foo, as we would like. Because Spring is aware of these getters and setters. It's just a normal Java being contract. Very simple. So you would expect that this would work as well, right? And it does. Because uh, when you run it, you can see that setter.foo actually prints pass. Very simple. However, as I said before, that we have this project right now, and the project also have a my class path. And theoretically, I should just be able to get rid of this and use the Spring Scala project, which is aware of Scala uh, getters and setters, and it works as well, right? You will see an error, an error, an error here because IntelliJ is not aware of these features yet. I should talk to them this afternoon, probably, so they won't make it red again. But this is the core idea, right? Spring Scala enables, it just gets detected by the Spring Framework, saying, oh, you have Scala on the class path. I'm now going to enable support for Scala properties, basically. That's the way it works. All right, now moving on. This is just simple, basic stuff. Simple, basic stuff. So, like I said, we have options. Of, I just showed you options to configure your beans in Scala, right, or in XML. But we can also do the same in Scala. This is, this is actually a completely new functionality, right? This, the stuff you saw before is sort of a halfway, uh, just a plug-in into the existing Java framework. This is completely new. It's called the functional configuration. That's a trait you can mix in into your configuration class. And in that sense, it works a bit similar to um, Java config, if you ever use that, right? To, to write a configuration class in, in, in Java and annotate it with the add configuration annotation and then annotate individual methods with bean. So I don't know how many of you guys have used it, but at least you heard about it probably, right? <clears throat> so in Scala, we, it's not really that fashionable, I guess you could say, to use annotations, right? It's all about functions. So what we did is create a functional configuration. There's no, you could use the, an, the annotation-based model, works perfectly fine, but this is more tweaked for Scala. And what does it do? Well, it supports a lot of things, right? Singletons and prototypes, just to, the basic things. You can write, wire up single and prototypes. You can do references. You can compose configurations by basically uh, extending classes or mixing in different configuration traits. It's, all the, just, it's just a class, after all, just a Scava class, so you can do whatever we want with it. Um, you can import XML. You can import add configuration classes. You can have init and destroy methods. Um, and you can even do bean profiles. So I'm going to demo that 
in a minute. But before we start, I just want to show you the, the basic simple example. On the left, we have XML configuration for a particular uh, set of beans where you have a person class and it just has a two constructor values or two constructor arcs. One is John and the other is Doe. And on the right hand is basically the Scala config or functional configuration equivalent of that. What you do is you extend this functional configuration trait and then you call a method on that base class. It's the method called bean. Right? And I'll show you later that there's a lot more things you can do. But this is the basic idea, right? Very similar models as you can see. XML and Scala look very similar. So on to the demo for that. So on to the demo for that. And we'll see how that goes. So let's close all this. And here I have. So here I have my person class. It's a bit more complicated than in the slide I just showed you. We have a first name and a last name. And we also have f uh, parents, basically, which are mutable and can also be no, which is a completely ridiculous <laughs> domain, of course. But that's just the, for this purpose of this demonstration, it will suffice. I've written a little to string as well because it just, it's easier to debug that way. So that's what I'm using. But the thing to remember is that you have first name, last name, very simple. There's a configuration here right, that uses that class. So what do I do here? I'm going to start with saying, OK, well, I'm going to start off by defining a bean named bean called Jack. And here, I'm actually supplying the bean name. Right? You don't have to do that. If you leave it out like this, then Spring will create a, um, Spring will create a bean for you, bean name for you, right? just as you use in XML. If you don't supply the ID attribute in the Spring XML, we will also generate a bean for name for you. So that's the same thing here. right? So we do that. We define a bean called Jack. We return a new person as a consequence. We do a bean. And I can show you where that bean comes from. It's just a class on the base class. So this is the functional configuration trait that I mixed in. And here we are calling bean. So what can you do with that? Provide a name. We're using basically standard Scala feature just to make it nice and readable. So the name by default is empty, but you can provide a name. You can provide aliases, right? Having multiple names. Provide a scope by default. It's a singleton. You can set it as lazy in it or not. And you have to create a bean function. And that's what this is. That's for all the thing that's in the block here. That's basically a function to create the bean. And when we construct this configuration, or we boot it up basically using an application context, as I'll show you later, we'll invoke that function to create the bean instance, basically. So compare that to Java config, where you have um, um, the annotation, annotated method with at bean. We'll invoke that method at runtime to create a bean as well. This is a bit much the same thing, except that it uses a function. Now, here we do the same. We have Jane, Jane Doe, and here we get to a bit more complicated things. So here, first of all, we're going to use an initializable person. That's a ridiculous name of a class, but it will suffice for now. That's just an extension of first person, except that it has an initialized Boolean, right? And I'll show you later what that, uh, what, why, what you can use that for. And then we're going to say, okay, well, I created a person, and I'm going to call <coughs> set its parents. After all, these are optional. You don't have to define them, right? As we know from our person class, um, but we do define them. And the way to do that is there's two ways, right? You can say, okay, I'm going to call get bean and say call a name, say okay, this is Jack, and it will work. But that's not very. Then you're doing basically a lookup, right? In a way, and a string-based lookup as well. What I'm doing right here is saying, OK, I assigned whatever that comes out of here, the bean method, I assigned that to a value called Jack. And I'm going to reuse use that value here. Um, and I'm going to use curlies for some reason. Why am I using curlies here? Well, as it turns out, let's go back here, that the bean method returns a bean lookup function. What's a bean lookup function? It's just a function, basically. No parameters. Um, and it will return an instance of the bean that you defined, basically. Why is that? Right? That's a pretty, we had a lot of debates about this internally when, when I wrote this. But the reason why is that imagine if Jack, so you could call, each time you call it, you do a get bean, you want to get a new instance. That's basically how prototypes work. Or it's a, serve, a session scoped, um, a session scoped bean or a request scoped bean. So, all these non-singleton 
um, non-singleton uh, uh, scoped beans, you have to support them in some way. And that's why the function comes in, basically. The function makes sure that if we invoke it, we get a new instance in, a, in a terms of a prototype, right? So if this would have been, let's say, uh, scope is, now let's say, oh, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit. And I'm gonna say, okay, the so scope prototype. Um, now, we, every time we, this bean is being invoked, we get a new instance. So this would mean that if I call Jack again here, we get a new instance, right? That's just making sure that's why the function is there, to make sure that the scoping works correctly. <coughs> Imagine this wouldn't have been a function, right? Imagine this would have been just a person in this instance. Person being, um, imagine Jack would have been a person instance. Then these two calls to Jack would have been pointing to the same instance, and that's not what you want if it's a prototype. Is this understandable for everybody, the reason why? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, onto that. So I'm just gonna refer to these two by using this prototype, and I'm gonna return John. <clears throat> by the way, you don't have to do all this this way. There's nice and consents, so I can just say, that's a really nice DSL. So, right, this would be the same, right? Using prototype instead of uh, the whole bean with all the flags. So instead of this, just use prototype. Basically. So back to the way I was. There we go. Oh, alternatively, I could also do <coughs> this. Right? Singleton. Registering singleton. And the funny thing is, in that case, you see a little bit of a red curly here. I guess you can see that. It does return an, an instance, right? So singleton returns type T in this case. <coughs> Excuse me. And the reason for that is because a singleton, you only want one instance in the first place, right? You don't need to do this thing about saying, oh, if it's a prototype, then I create a new instance, etc. It's a singleton, create, the Spring container will create an instance once and just reuse that all over the place. So you can safely assign it to a value and re reuse that value all over the place. So that's why singleton is a bit different than prototype, for instance. See? Prototype returns a bean lookup function, just like the other uh, the general bean call. All right. <clears throat> so moving on. Going back once again. All right. So let's see if this works, right? Or how do we make it work? That's the big question for sure, for now. And it's very similar to any kinds of other application context in nationalization, basically. What you do, saying, well, I want you to create a functional configuration application context. That's just another instance of application context, given that person configuration class. You don't have to do it this way. You can also register the, the, uh, the class with the application context, but this will do for now. Then I'm gonna say, okay, give me the bean of John, basically. Print it, print its father, and let's just skip this for now because it's not that interesting for now. So let's see if this works. I hope I, my typing didn't screw it up. So now we get to the waiting part. I guess I should have prepared some jokes. Oh, there we go. So, okay. So it works, right? So you print John, then we print his father and his mother, and it all looks good. So now on to the, this part. What does this do? Well, uh, let's see now. As you see here, <clears throat> when you register a bean, you can also call a init or destroy block. Now, init, as itself, it's not that necessary, right? I could have easily moved this initialize to here and say, okay, well, probably here. Say, so do it there, because it's just code after all, right? Oh, one step back, I guess maybe you guys don't know what init and destroy methods are. These are basically methods in Spring that you can point, say, well, when you initialize this class, I want you to call this method. So maybe opening a database connection or something or starting a connection pool or whatever. And when you, the destroy method is a bit more interesting because that will, um, that will actually be called when the application is shut down. Or for instance, when your Tomcat is shutting down, then we will call all those destroy methods. It's very useful for cleaning up your resources, right? So if you have a database connection pool or something, you wanna make sure that that properly cleans up whenever your application shuts down, right? So that's where the initialize and destroy methods, especially the destroy methods coming. 
And like I said, the initialize is not that interesting because, like I said, I can just call initialize here. That's not fancy, but let's keep it there for the purpose of the presentation. The destroy method, however, is interesting. And this works a bit differently than in Spring XML. In Spring XML, you typically point to a method saying, well, on destruction clo call close, typically, right, on the database, on a data source. Call close. Here it's a bit different because what you get passed on is actually the instance, right? So that's why you can just call underscore. This is a function once again. The destroy is just a function. I can show you the definition here. The destroy function given t and returning nothing, and once again returning the bean lookup unit. All right. So that's what we do here. Basically, we, we in this function we say, well, this person I've just been given initialized here or created here. I want you to call destroy on that. And what does destroy do? It does nothing more than just setting a Boolean flag to false. It's nothing fancy. But for the purpose of a demonstration, it's pretty quite nice. So we have all that. Let's see if it works. If everything goes well, at this point, we should see, should see true, right? Then we close the application. It means that all destroy methods are called. And then at this point, we should see false. So let's hope that it works. Gives me some time to drink a bit more water. There we go. So ignoring all this, right? We have some info from Spring here. That's not that interesting. We have all this. Here it's true. So that's the it's initialized. That's good. And then we close the application context. We get some feedback over about that, saying, "Oh, I'm closing down, destroying singletons, blah blah blah." And then we have false, right? So that's the way to define these destroy methods. Especially once again, destroy methods are very useful when cleaning up resources. But there's other features as well, right? I can show you um, things like I can do import XML, right? And just give it a string saying, okay, class path, uh, let's say, nah, that's probably not a smart idea. idea. Context.xml. All right, so any. Application context, it's all over. The class path will be picked up by this and will just be used, right? I can, and then you can refer to it. Obviously, you have to refer to it in another way, right? So imagine the example where the jack would be in this XML file. I'll probably have to do something like get bean um, jack, right? But it will still work, right? So you're, you're losing a bit of that type safety because you're mixing XML with, with, with classes, obviously, uh, but that's the way it is. I can do the same with import class, right? So that's an add configuration class. Works very similarly. Uh, let's see what else is in there when it comes to functionality. Oops. Yada, yada, yada. I think, oh, profile, of course. Yeah, that's interesting. So. You can also say, okay, profile, oops. And I'm going to say this is my dev profile. And then everything, oops. <clears throat> yeah, I put in here, saying data source. Uh, saying new commons DDP, DCP. Commons data source. No, I don't, I don't think I have commons DBCP on my password, but. Uh, DVCP, uh, data source, right? Blah, 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 blah. And then my production, I could say, well, for my production profile, I want you to say Oracle data source, right? For instance. So what this will do, this has been a feature in, in new, in, newly introduced in Spring 3.1, but we also support it in, the, in this functional configuration trait saying, okay, well, anything in the dev profile, anything in this block, basically, will have the dev profile, and whenever that profile is activated, it can be dependent on system properties, can be dependent on system environment, can be dependent on pretty much anything. Only when that profile is active, we're going to register these beans. Right? It's not just one bean. I can do multiple ones here. It's nothing. It's just a, it's just a block, basically. And um, this is all code, right? I can do very interesting things here. Hello, the box. And theoretically, 
So you can do anything you want in here. That's basically the giveaway here. You can do all kinds of conditionals here. You can do if, else, all kinds of things here. See? Somewhere it should be. There we go. But the key thing to remember is that you basically register a bean. You extend the functional configuration class. You register a bean with the bean, basically, or singleton or prototype. But bean is the generic one. And you can um, <coughs> refer, to, you can assign those to values. And then you invoke those values. These are functions. You invoke those functions to do a bean lookup, essentially. All right? So also do aliases and all kinds of other things here. I think that's uh, probably uh, talked about enough about this particular feature. But this is, this is a really neat idea. And uh, probably going to build on top of it a bit more. We can also imagine special configurations for web environments where you can do stuff like registering a bean in a session scope or registering a bean in a request scope. That's all on the, definitely on the radar. <clears throat> also things like um, uh, all, the turn, all the namespaces that we have, right? So all the uh, transaction management namespaces, all those kinds of ideas are also on the radar. It's not, for now, it's, it's pretty basic because I just want to put something out there and see what, what, uh, how people like it. All right, so on with the presentation. So, about talking about collections a little bit. The Scala Collection API is, is a lot richer than, than the Java one we have in Java. We have sequences, we have index sequences, we have linear sequences, we have buffers, sets, maps, etc. Et There's a whole bunch of sequences. I'm not going to go into the differences between all of them, but just believe me when I tell you that there's a lot of them. And also, there's typically two flavors of each one as well, right? So you have mutable and immutable versions. Of course, Scala really proposes saying, okay, do use the mutable versions if you can, or at least perhaps start with an immutable version and then convert it into a mutable version later to use that when you're running. Um, and uh, so definitely the focus is on mutable, but immutable versions are there, are there as well. The thing that we have in the Spring Scala project is basically support for all of these. So that means you can inject in XML, right? That's, that's what I mean with support. If you're using the functional configuration I just showed you, you don't need any kind of support. It's just Scala code. So if you want to set, assign a property to a, a Scala sequence, just do it in code. Right? There's nothing weird about that. But if you want to use wire up a Spring Bean in, uh, or a Scala Bean in, in, in Spring XML, then you probably do need support for that. So I'm going to show you that now. For support comes in two flavors, basically, property editors and XML namespaces. Property editors are used for converting the, the raw string values that you see in the XML, converting those into uh, the Scala collections. The XML space space is very similar to the util namespace, if you ever use that. So you have to think about things like util, uh, util list, util set, etc. So that's all in a special Scala. So that's all in a special Scala util namespace we have. So let's close up all this. No longer necessary. And uh, go here. Once again, very simple bean, um, taking a constructor argument of a sequence of strings. Right? <clears throat> and now I want to wire that up in XML. Uh, here's that thing. Right? So let's see if I can get rid of this thing. So getting rid of, uh, so we have the XML here saying, OK, the full class name, constructor arc, and just signing a list. Once again, IntelliJ is giving an error because it doesn't recognize the sequence. Right? It doesn't really understand it. And that's just something that uh, needs to be implemented on their side. The thing is that Spring does support it, um, and you'll probably see a uh, full bar list. So we have a little app for this as well. Once again, opening an app context, getting the collection bean, and then printing it off. So let's see if we can make that work. There we go. <clears throat> so how does that work? Right? That's basically where this little bit comes in. Let's see. This bit will say, well, I want Spring to enable support for these property editors, basically for these Scala property editors. So, and that's where we register the Scala editor register. That's just one way of doing it. The alternative way is saying, OK, I don't like this. This is a bit of a magical XML. What I can do instead is saying, I have this Scala util namespace. 
and as reported here, as you can see, uh, very similar to the um, to the util namespace we have for Spring Java, I call it. <laughs> it's normal Spring, I guess. So we, we assign it the sequence, and we say, well, instead of just doing the list, if I run it now, I'll probably get an error, an error because it will say, well, I see this list value, but I don't know how to convert from this list to uh, to my to a Scala collection, to a Scala sequence. Let's see if that actually is true. See, there you go. Ooh, big red font. Something went wrong. That was expected once again, right? Because we can't. Spring now doesn't know how to convert this to this. Why is that? Because we disabled this register here. Using the namespace, I can say, well, oops, is uh, Scala seek like that. This can go, and then we just do this this way. Some people prefer the one, some people prefer the other, but it will both, whoops, work. Well, that's for doing demos, I guess. I have no idea what I did wrong, but I did something wrong, but I'm going to move on anyway. It worked this morning. <laughs> I can promise you that. <clears throat> Probably did something wrong somewhere. All right. So basic support for collections is in there, right? All of these collections you there, right? All of these collections you have, both in mutable and immutable versions, um, that's all in the, um, in the class we have. <clears throat> Finally, we have, um, it's a feature, we have basically the Spring templates. Well, I guess most of you already know all about the Spring templates, right? These are, as it says here, consistent and convenient ways of approaching data access. You have the the grandfather of them all, I guess, is the JDBC template, right? Really convenient way to do data access, SQL data access, without writing any of the, um, the standard um, uh, uh, code, the try, catch, catch blocks that you have to do in order to do it properly. So that proper way of doing SQL databases with, uh, with JDBC is done by us. The only thing you have to supply are things like um, uh, the, the basically the one thing that you do need to do is your SQL statement or your, the way you want to interpret the data, all those kind of row mapper interfaces, etc. So JDBC template, JMS template, REST template, there's a whole bunch of these templates. So uh, web service template, I can, uh, that's there, it's for doing SOAP access. We have ways of accessing Kix databases, Kix backends, back all these templates. And they basically form the same way of interpreting, right? So you, you start them up. Um, they're thread safe after, convert, after construction, and then you just use them. And they typically have methods of, of getting data or maybe even sending data, et cetera. And what the template does is just taking care of all the resources. So opening connection, then typically doing your stuff, the stuff that you provide, using a callback or something, and then making sure that the, the connection is properly closed down and cleaned up. So what we have in Spring Scala is basically um, Scala versions of these, right? Um, of the most popular Spring templates we have right now. And what they do is basically fall down in three categories. So what we do, instead of using callbacks, right? Things like row mapper, you might have used, if you ever used the JDBC template, things like row mapper, all these interfaces that you have to implement in typically in an anonymous inner class. And, um, so we, we, we change that to using functions, right? Because now we have a functional language. We can use functions as arguments, something that Java doesn't have yet, right? It's coming, but it's, uh, it's not there yet. So now we have functions as well. We use option, right? Option is basically uh, an enumeration of two values. It can either be something or it's nothing, right? And that's very useful in the case where you, in Java, you typically return null, as you'll show you later. And here we typically say, OK, with the, with the templates, when null means something, it's typically better to return not, nothing instead of none in the case of an option. I'll show you that in a minute. And finally, we use class manifests. It's a, a bit more advanced feature, but I'll show you that in a minute as well. So here's an example. I'm going to actually show you that example right now. I'm going to actually show you that example right now in some code. Uh, that's probably a better idea than just a slide. So let's close this off. Here we go. So I'm do, going to do, a, I didn't know how dependable the internet was, and so I didn't want to do if anything that involves internet access in my demos. Turns out that my demo didn't broke up anyway, but what I'm trying to do here is 
doing some JMS interaction. Basically, it's very simple. Okay, so I'm going to use ActiveMQ, set up a non-persistent ActiveMQ queue. Um, <clears throat> setting some basic properties. You don't have to do this, right? This is all pretty much unnecessary. I, but just to show you, basically, what we're going to do is saying, okay, I'm going to create a Java version of the JMS template, set some properties on it, and then wrap it with the Scala version. Right? So you can see that these things live in the same package, except that here we have put Scala in between, just to make it clear. I'm not completely sure about this yet. We could also do something like a naming convention, like a, maybe a rich JMS template that seems also very popular in, in Scala frameworks, but I'm not completely decided on it. But for the moment, it's, it's, it's the same class name, it's just that the Scala package is in there between. And we're just going to assign that to the Java version we have. Once again, you don't have to do that. You can do it like this. You can just say, okay, pass on the connection factory. That will work as well. But in this case, I just wanted to show you that it's possible, basically. So two things. We're going to send a message <coughs> and send in this version of the JMS template, this Scala version. This, there's three variants, right? If you ever use the JMS template, it looks very familiar. But it's basically three variants. You can either use send with a Nothing, then you'll use a default destination. You can use it with a destination, or you can use it with a destination name. But we're going to use this version right here. And the second argument, this is actually saying, okay, I'm going to use it. Given a session, I want you to provide me with a message. That's the function that I want you to provide. So that's what we're doing here, saying, okay, <clears throat> given a session, I want you to create a text message containing hello world and send that to my, uh, to my queue, my default destination name here. Right, so that's one part. Second up is receive. Now receive is a method. It says it actually quite nicely in the Java doc. Receive the message synchronously. So that's probably not the way you want to do things, but for the purpose of a demo, it's, nice, it's good enough. Synchronously from a specific destination, but you only wait until a specific time. And specific time is expressed through the um, timeout parameter that I showed you earlier. Okay, so I'm going to receive something. And then what you see is that you return, it returns an option. So basically saying the Java version of this, I can take a peek at this. The Java version says return. The message we send by the consumer or null if the time not expires, right? And that's a bit, that's always been a bit strange to me when using Java. So returning nulls always a bit, for instance, if you're returning a collection of things, do you return an empty collection? Do you return a null? The Scala has this nice option thingy. So an option of a message, it could be either a message or it's, it's nothing, right? And then we can use um, pattern matching right here, saying, okay, Scala template receive from this queue. I could actually do it like this as well. No need for that message. Oh, guess there is. <laughs> no idea why. Um, and, um, and say, okay, I'm going to use... Uh, uh, I'm going to match on the response, and if it's a text message, if it's something, specifically in this case a text message, print it, right? So message received, text message, get text. If it's nothing, then I'm going to print out no text message received. So let's run this thing, and if everything goes well, you should see right, I'm sending some JMS messages. Demo goes us There we go. So message received. Right? All works well. These are not the only versions of, this is not the only template that we have, the JMS template. Like I said, there's also uh, things like the simple JVC template. Right, that's here. So the Scala version of that. And what we try to use here is something like um, just making it easier. Right? So using, for instance, if you ever use this, you know about query for object. Basically, it takes a string uh, argument, can take a map of argument strings. What we may do is make sure that it's a Scala map instead of a Java map, right? So you don't have to do the conversion. We'll do the conversion for you. You can use a function, right? as you can see here. We map, we convert that function into a row mapper. It's also things like using sequences. Right, using option, all these kinds of convenient things, just to make this, the Java template, which is a very useful class, make it more useful in terms of Scala usage. Also, the REST template is there. Right? 
Yeah, REST template, there we go. And I could have demoed that if I had dependable internet access, but it doesn't. I don't, so. Um, you have things like get for any, right? Instead of the Java version of this, it has a get for object. And of course, in Scala, the root of the, in the, the uh, uh, hierarchy, the class hierarchy, is called any instead of object, so that's why I renamed that method to get for any. Given a URL thing, giving an array of variables, and using the implicit manifest. That's a bit of an interesting thing. What does that do? Well, let's see if I can show you that. Basically, what it means is, let's say that I have a template here. I can do stuff like In the Java version of this, you always had to say get for uh, object and then also provide the, st the string, the class, basically. You had to say, okay, get for object and then say HTTP. And then you had to do something like in, in, in Java, you would do string.class. In Scala, you'd obviously do class of just to help the type matching system. Well, it turns out that in Scala you don't even have to do this because every the compiler helps you a little bit. It tries to solve this uh, problem for you by just saying, okay, well, you can provide it like this. And it even if it does, it's not even completely necessary in some cases to provide this program. If it can infer it somehow, you don't even have to do this. But in this case, I do have to confer, in, confer it because I just declared the result as a vowel. And um, so I need, I need to tell the compiler about uh, that I expect a string here. But it's nicer this way. It's a bit shorter. You don't have to do weird class of things or weird um, dot class things as well. All right, so. Um, in the project, like I said, are a lot of these templates. I can go probably go a bit further into them. Not sure if there's any others that I didn't talk about. Yeah, oh, there's one I want to talk about. It's called the transaction management um, trait. It's also quite nice. Um, transaction management is actually a trait you can inherit, and then you have a transactional method. And the transactional method is um, everything you put in a block that you can pass, you pass a block on there, a function basically. Everything you do in that function will be executed in a spring transaction. So let's see if I can do that. Let's just create this a new class somewhere. Oops. Helps if I can type new. So what I can do is say, okay, extends transaction management. And then what that will give me is a, um, is a transaction block, transactional block. And everything I put in here, so um, use database one, or use database two, etc., etc. Everything I put in there is basically executed transactionally, given a transaction manager. Right? You have to specify the transaction manager. That's why it's probably complaining, saying, "Well, it doesn't work. I don't see a transaction man manager," but it is in there. Right? So, platform transaction manager is provided, and then you can override all the Properties, right? So the propagation level, set the isolation level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just things once again to make it a bit easier to use Spring from Scala, and um, that's quite helpful. All right, so that's the demo I did for the, um, the templates. Once again, there's uh, about four templates in there now. The JDC templates in there, JMS templates in there. JMS, REST template, and the transaction template, or the transaction management trait, in a way. It's all there in there for you to use. So how, what about the schedule? Well, like I said, we opened the repo. I've been working on this off and on for a year now, but only quite seriously in the last half year, um, in some way. Uh, the GitHub repo was basically opened on the end of October. Um, it's now there's no release yet, unfortunately. There will be a first milestone in a 
probably this month or at the beginning of December. We're going to put out the first milestone with everything there. But it's pretty easy to build yourself. It's just a Maven build for now. We'll probably switch to SWT soon. But once again, these are the things that I didn't want to focus on in the beginning. And I really value your input, basically. That's the, that's the key thing and I would like to know. Is if you guys are using Spring and Scala in your project and you have certain problems, you're saying, well, I'm trying to do this, but it doesn't work, or this doesn't feel right, or can you help me? That's basically what I'd like to hear from you, either here now, in a, in a few moments, or through uh, uh, Jira, or through GitHub, or any form or way you can contact me, or Twitter, or etc. This is the URL, if you want to contribute in some way. There's a, the code is there, there's also a wiki in there. It explains all the details I talked about today in a bit more detail, right? Explaining a bit deeper why certain things work a certain way. Uh, what else is in there, etc. So that's all there as well. Uh, the Spring Source, GitHub, and the Spring Scala project. Um, and I guess I have about five more minutes for questions and uh, hopefully answers as well. Are there any questions? Yeah, somebody wants to. Do, yeah, I, I can't see you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Your your question. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, a Bean declared prototype, a Bean declared singleton. Mm -hmm. You made them all vowels. Yeah. Why not make the prototype adapt so it is evaluated every time it is invoked? I think you can drop the parents then as well. It could be, actually. Um, let's talk about it afterwards. Okay? <laughs> can you come over? Because yeah. it's a good idea. I, uh, I I haven't thought about it yet. So maybe maybe we can do that. So. Um, not so much a question as it's a suggestion, I guess, and it's very much appreciated. Yeah, please come up, come come up to me in a, in a, after we're done with this talk. Any other questions or suggestions, for that matter? Sure, you went ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely on the radar as well. I've I've played around. The question is, how do we can we create a bean that express represents a lambda expression? Um, I've played around a little bit on this. Uh, I did. I did get something working. Uh, however, I didn't. Wasn't completely happy with the way I did it. So I decided to drop that support in the end. But it's it's definitely on the radar. We'll definitely think about it and also uh, uh, thinking about ways to 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 represent or to wire up these new uh, uh, Scala uh, um, data types, basically. Right. So yeah, definitely on on the radar as well. Any other questions? Yes. Scala tries to promote uh, the functional paradigm, uh, try to promote also the classes and not class are immutable, yeah. objects are immutable. Uh, how do you see it fitting with, with a spring, uh, let's say, configuration driven way of doing things? So, as you show in your demonstration, a lot of things are bounced because those things need to be set at some point. Sorry, bars, because they need to be set at some point in time. Uh, I felt a little bit of friction between the two uh, models. I don't know how you feel. I don't. So the question is really, as I said myself in the talk as well, I said, okay, Scala really tries to enforce the immutable data model, the functional programming model, basically. And for a while, we've been trying to to suggest it as well. I mean, what I said, for instance, was constructor injection is one way to make it easier to do uh, a dependency injection as well, right? Just inject all the values at construction time and you're done. And that's something we've been proposing for ages, <laughs> right? As long as I can remember at least. So construction injection is definitely, if there's only one thing you learn at this presentation, ignoring the whole scala part, so please use constructor injection when, when you can, right? However, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have uh, optional dependencies, right? And you want to assign those. Sometimes you want to assign those. Sometimes you don't want to assign those. And that's where the VARs come in. I mean, there's a reason I, weigh, I, I look at it very pragmatically. Right? I think you should definitely go for false in, the case, in terms of Scala features. Definitely go for false. But sometimes you have to use a VAR. And then we support that. But Spring is not about... It, Ten years ago, you might have made that statement, saying, well, Spring really... Uh, uh, enforces or, or tries to be, because at that point we only had setter injection, but for at least nine years now we have had constructor injection and we're being more and more <laughs> vocal about please use that because it's better and um, 
So I don't, I don't see any clash between those two models, really. I don't think Spring enforces a mutable data, mutable classes, really. It just, um, if anything, you could blame the Java language because you don't have named constructors in the Java language using reflection, right? You can't, in, Sp in Spring obviously does a lot of reflection, and uh, when it comes to doing reflection based on constructor parameters, they don't have a name. If you, unless you compile with debug, and then you can pull them out. So that's been one reason why constructor injection has been a bit less popular. But I still think that's not a good reason. Right? I really have tried to enforce constructor injection whenever I can. And as a consequence, I don't see any clash with that and Scala. I don't see any reason. Uh, I think that's why my property, my presentation started with saying, well, first of all, use constructor injection, then use at bean property, and if you can, or use the Spring Scala project with support for Scala properties. But you don't, you don't typically you don't have to. I hope that's made it a bit clearer. Yeah? I don't think I have time, I have one minute left, so I don't think that's enough time for another question. But uh, yeah, we do. Time's up, it says. I have to stop. <laughs> All right, so I thank you for your, for your, for your uh, attendance. And uh, if you want to know more about this, I'll be here. I'll be also downstairs at our VMware booth if you want to talk to me about this. And uh, once again, thank you for your attention.